right, so we're here today uh, with Naomi Brockwell, who is the CEO and founder of Rainsworth Productions, producer at the Motion Picture Institute, a policy associate at New York City Bitcoin Center, and the creator and host of BitcoinGirl.org. She's also the executive producer of the upcoming feature film, Subconscious. Naomi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be fun. Absolutely. So uh, just to get us started, uh, you've got a really impressive list of things that you're doing, and it really spans a lot of areas. Um, but you're pretty much well known in the, in the decentralized community as Bitcoin Girl. Can you tell us a little bit about that idea and how you came about it? Right. Um, well, that, that was a little bit ridiculous, actually. Uh, people were, were claiming all these names all over the place. Uh, it was a lot earlier in Bitcoin's history, and no one had really claimed Bitcoin Girl, so I thought, why not? Um, so I just set up a, you know, a website and whatnot, and then I, um, I was very interested in Bitcoin. I love Austrian economics, so for me, Bitcoin was just a fantastic example of a working currency that is decentralized, uh, that isn't controlled by a central authority like a government. I thought that was pretty fantastic, so I just fell in love with it. Um, and then Bitcoin Girl actually became a vehicle for me to educate people uh, about the technology. So I mean, I'm not a tech head myself, um, but I do uh, sort of work in the circles a lot. So I know more than your average bear about Bitcoin, and I find that you know, there's been such a negative bias in the mainstream media against Bitcoin that I thought someone really should go about trying to turn that tide and actually educate people, uh, teach them that this is something like an incredible technology that people should be very excited about and it's in their best interests. So that was my aim with this. I wanted to interview people in the space. Uh, I wanted to... Um, uh, you know, let them know why Bitcoin is exciting. And if I could be that mediator between the people who are incredibly technically savvy and excited about the technology and those who really don't understand it and who are giving it a bad name, I wanted to re-educate and, and inform people. And what has the response been so far to your um, efforts to educate through Bitcoin Girl and through your other um, projects? Well, it really depends on the person. So I think that the Bitcoin community in general tends to be um, pretty positive about the efforts. They like the fact that there are people out there trying to uh, get people on board. You know, they're excited about this. They want to see more people involved with this community. Um, on the other side of things, I am constantly getting into fights with people who are very uneducated uh, about the technology, um, but who you know, insist on trying to convince me why it's this terrible idea, why it can't work, why it isn't working, uh, why we're enabling uh, criminals to run rife through society. Um, so I'm constantly uh, having discussions with these people about this. Um, so that's a, you know, it's also interesting for me. I mean, the United States, is, and especially New York, I live in New York, um, it's very open-minded about this. Uh, uh, they're much more on board than the rest of the world, I think. And I really discovered that last time I went back to Australia. Um, and I, I would talk to people about Bitcoin and some of my friends back there would say, like, what, what is this thing? I really don't understand it. And I try to explain it to them them and you could see they just shut off whereas most people I, I talk with here in New York communities they're very interested they want to know more it's a lot more in the news Australians uh, haven't yet uh, jumped on board with this yet so we, we should see that hopefully uh, soon great so uh, sort of like as you're talking to people like I, I've noticed people fall into like two camps you know it's the people who don't quite understand it will argue against it yeah, and then it seems like once they dive down the rabbit hole, uh, they start to read about it and learn about it, and then suddenly they become, you know, real supporters of it. What's been in your experience like that that process? How does that take place? Um, I I definitely have found that the difference is education, and I've written a few op eds about this. That you know, I mean, it tells you something when some of the smartest people in the world are throwing millions into this technology. Um, you know, if if um, Bill Gates <laughs> goes to the press and says this is incredible uh, technology, guys, take note of this, and you're going to say, oh, I think I know the tech space better than Bill Gates. I, you know, I think that if someone like that 
says this is something to be interested in, it should put up a flag to at least be a little bit curious. At least look into it a little bit more before you slam it back down. Um, but I, yeah, I've definitely seen that the difference is education. I recently spoke at a ManCal event. They're an organisation in Australia that educates people uh, about economics. And um, and during that talk, I had a guy. You know, I was talking mainly about Bitcoin. It's a big passion of mine. And I had this guy give this incredible rebuttal to me. And he, well, he was very intelligent and put his hand up. And this happens all the time. These people who've thought about the questions, the hard questions they can get you with. And he said, "Now listen." You've, you've given a good talk tonight, uh, but let me just try something. I'm going to ask the audience how many people actually own Bitcoin. And uh, so he asked the audience, and I think one person put their hand up, two, including myself, and uh, he says to me, there you go. <laughs> and I, I asked him, so, so what were you proving there? Um, are, are you saying that because the technology hasn't yet lifted off that it's not worthwhile? If you were to ask people at the advent of the internet how many people had the internet and uh, you had one person put their, their hand up, uh, are you going to then condemn it and say this is not a worthwhile idea? Because, I, I mean, that just... Um, Slaps, <laughs> slaps all the wonderful technologies in the face uh, for, from history. So yeah, I do, I do get a lot of people arguing from a point of um, an, a, an uninformed position. I think you're right with every technology that happens, especially if it's challenging something that has existed for hundreds of years that people have been taught and it's ingrained mm -hmm. in, their, in their psyche that money works this way. You go to the bank, yeah. you get money. You know, it just it really is challenging everything. So I, I, I that doesn't surprise me necessarily, but what, what did surprise me when I got into the Bitcoin space officially, because I was someone who worked in a completely different industry and really got attracted to this and eventually got a job in it after a year or two of being a fan, and I noticed that there's a lot more women involved than I would assume just from you know reading the, the our Bitcoin subreddit and Bitcoin talk, which are the big places on the mm -hmm. internet for discussions, and you still get... I, I still hear this, and it's 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 less often than it was a year ago. But I still hear the you know there's not that many women involved. It's just a bunch of you know twenty something guys, and for the most part it's true. But there's also there is more women than I feel is represented by the media. How do we reach that demographic better? How do we make it so th so the Bitcoin space is something that they feel comfortable in participating in? That you know that they're interested in, and and what are some things that you you think really need to happen, not just by and this really isn't by any centralized Bitcoin like a found the Bitcoin Foundation, but more from the businesses that are building this economy. What do they need to do to reach out to this and change this a little bit so the the, the percentage isn't eighty twenty or eighty five fifteen. It's more like fifty fifty or sixty forty. Right. Well, I mean, that's a that's a tough question. You could say the same thing about computer science or engineering, or you know, I think men and women have different interests. Um, and also, I think, I mean, there are not many people you can get excited about a currency. It's not like you can go out there and be like, "Hey, guys, U.S. dollar, get excited about it." Like, I mean, it's just a thing you use, right? You know. Well, you, I, I'll say it. this: How many rap songs are about the U.S. dollar? The U.S. dollar is incredibly well marketed. Everyone knows that, you know, it's all about that green. There's symbols that mean it. Like, the marketing for the U.S. dollar, which I think was almost all done just coincidentally, is great. Um, I'm a big fan of, I think the, the industry leaders in Bitcoin need to get together and pick a brand for Bitcoin, a, a, a one well, logo I... that everyone uses. But... That's just ranting off, but I, I do think the U.S. dollar is well marketed, actually. I, I think it's uh, futile. I, I mean, I think it's redundant is a better word, though, mm -hmm. because the U.S. dollar is mandated. Right. Um, there is absolutely no reason for someone to accept the U.S. dollar as, as currency if it wasn't mandated, because it's going to be worth less the next day <laughs> than when you accepted it. There is no reason for, for people to accept it. Um, that's what... You know, centralized banking, that's what inflation does. Um, Bitcoin, on the other hand, has incredible advantages for people. So if you were to try and market it, you would you know, talk to those advantages. Uh, the gender difference, I mean, I don't know how you overcome that. Honestly, I think that, in my opinion, I mean, I, there are a lot of people out there who just know so much more about this than I do, but in my opinion, it's the vendors who will really um, make this, this pick up. If we can get more vendors to accept Bitcoin, um, then it will give, you know, it, it will increase the number of people that are using it. Uh, it's only when things become really popular that uh, you, you know you you hit that that critical mass. I know that sounds like a catch twenty two, <laughs> but um, 
I think it's just going to stay on the fringes until we get more vendors on board, and then it will just become something that you hear about everywhere. Overstock will, is using it. Uh, Amazon will use it. eBay is, is you know, on the brink of, of getting involved with that more heavily. All of that um, really helps the branding of Bitcoin because it makes it seem mainstream, it makes it seem safe. Uh, people don't want to swap out their US dollars um, that have been marketed so well for something that they don't know too much about. So the more we can get it uh, into larger vendors, the more we can get it in a positive light into the media, the better it will be. I think you bring a very um, interesting and unique perspective to Bitcoin um, have, with your background really in media and in acting and producing. How did you first become, uh, I guess, attracted to um, this sort of field for your, for your talents? And how has this really informed your work in Bitcoin and your interest in Bitcoin? Would you say you're acting and you're producing? So that, so, well, I actually didn't get into Bitcoin through the acting and producing. I, I started out in economics um, and that's sort of my basis. And I'm a big fan of Austrian economics and I actually fell in love with Bitcoin uh, because I'm very interested in monetary policy. I'm very interested in centralized banking um, in fiat currencies and exploring different currencies. So that's how I fell in love with Bitcoin. Um, but it is interesting to see some um, uh, analogies that can be made between the movie industry as it is today and currency. I think the world is on the brink of a, a very peer-to-peer uh, paradigm and it's very exciting you know uh, applications like like uber fantastic Airbnb fantastic 3d printing um, it, all of these things which uh, take control out of centralized uh, bodies and disperse it decentralize it if you will um, I think that it's an exciting time and I think that you know you've seen that in the film industry you've seen um, the distribution methods completely change. It's no longer a big player's game. Anyone can make a film. I mean, we walk around with a um, yeah, with an HD camera in our smartphone. So it's um, it's very easy for you to make a high quality film these days. To have high quality editing equipment, it really doesn't cost much at all. Uh, so anyone can do that, and that's exciting. Um, and I, I really like the way that we, you, you know, you don't need too much capital to be able to go into this field. There's not too much of a barrier to entry and distribution platforms like YouTube, I mean, that has completely revolutionized uh, the film industry. Quite often, you, you know, you can watch feature films on YouTube now and they're free and uh, they're made by um, by people who are, you know, showing a unique perspective to the world, not, not necessarily a studio which is hindered by um, certain special interests, you know. Um, so that's exciting, and you see the same in currency. You know, Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer technology. It takes the um, uh, control away from government, away from central banks. In fact, like just this afternoon, I had a meeting with a guy who's just created a new app. I think it's called Currency IO, if I remember that correctly. But it's it's fascinating because I mean, he's looking at uh, exchange rates and the fact that when you uh, go to Australia. You know, you are paying a, a, a difference on the exchange rate. Uh, you're going to be paying, let, let's say, for every $100, um, you're going to be paying $22 in fees, or you're going to be losing $22 when you exchange it. And then, you you know, you have some time in Australia, and when you come back, you're going to convert your Australian dollars back to US dollars. You're going to lose you know, another $22 or whatnot. So what if we could find people who had Australian dollars and US dollars and just connect them in a decentralized way? If we knew where they were, and we met up face to face and just exchange the dollars for dollars according to whatever the exchange rate is. Like that's fantastic to me because no longer does it have to go through centralized banking, no longer do you have to deal with the monopolies that you find when you go to the airport and there's just like one <laughs> exchange that, that you deal with so they can charge whatever prices they want. This is an amazing decentralized system. So I was very excited to learn about that. I'll probably interview him in the next few weeks uh, to learn more about this. Um, but yeah, especially for someone like myself, you know, I do a lot of travel and this just sounds fantastic that I don't have to, you know, give up a lot of my my money in in payments and fees. That that's absolutely true, and you're hitting on something that's really close and dear to a lot of our hearts here. Um, you, when you anytime you see sort of the accessibility of publishing platforms uh, increase or the ability, the bandwidth of of information transfer increasing. So, for example. You can, you can go all the way back to when speech was first developed, when written language was first developed. 
up to the Gutenberg printing press, right? It increases the flow of information and communication. And Napster and the internet and all of this, these models are rapidly changing. And you'll notice that the period of time between these events is, is, is decreasing over time. What does it look like, uh, what is a publishing model, you know, sort of following this Austrian school of thought where competition is a good thing, what does the publishing model look like uh, in a world where there's so much content and where do aggregators, platforms, where does all that fit in? Where does that leave us? Well, I mean, that's a great uh, question and I think that there's going to be an ever, um, ever better uh, uh, need for publishing platforms, even because even though we can all put out our material straight onto the internet, so much of uh, monetization or uh, being able to you know um, make your filmmaking sub sustainable, so much of that depends on wide viewership and all of that. Now, if you're going on YouTube these days and you have hundreds of thousands of clips to choose from. How do you know what's going to be good? I, you know, I, I would say that these days time more than any before ever before is becoming the most valuable resource. It isn't our money, it isn't the amount we pay for something. It's knowing that if I watch two hours of a film, am I going to get those two hours back? You know, is that going to be a complete waste of my time? Um, even ten minutes these days, our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. Investing ten minutes in a clip, no way. People will click on something that's two minutes long, then they're done. And if they're not ca captured in the first 14 seconds, then they're out of there. So when you, you have aggregators that have a brand that you can trust, um, then that's that's a fantastic uh, that's a fantastic tool for viewers. So I mean HBO is is great. They completely reinvented television. Uh, they're a platform that um, was outside of the uh, main stations and uh, they redefined what television was. They made it this long form epic um, uh, format that was basically like a super long feature film and people were happy to watch a series because they knew that the quality would be high. If HBO is pumping that out and advertising it then it's probably worth watching. Um, and you're going to see, um, see that happen uh, with all kinds of different platforms on, on the internet. So Naomi, don't you feel though that with even aggregators that there's sort of a, a, a competition in philosophy where if we have these larger companies like HBO or even Netflix, which is really revolutionizing, revolutionizing how content is distributed, mm -hmm. right? Like, don't you feel that you know there's some sort of difference between the decentral philosophy and having these central aggregators? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, what I like is that there are no barriers to entry, so people do recognize good quality when they see it. Now getting them to actually watch it in the first place can be an issue. But if you can get people to watch it in the first place, I mean, you can use social networks for that. You can use Kickstarter. That's something that's exciting about Kickstarter. You know, crowdfunding campaigns, again, they're a sort of peer-to-peer um, -peer system for raising money for your film. Now, Kickstarter isn't about reaching out to people who don't know you. You know, you're never going to have someone just scrolling around on Kickstarter and say, oh, that's a project I want to give $50 to. I've never met this person, but, you know, I just want to give $50. You're not going to find it. Kickstarter is for raising money from your family and your friends. So, you know, if you can reach out to that network, and everyone has a network like that. Everyone has an immediate network. And uh, if they like your stuff, then they will promote it. And that is the key. It's starting with the people, you know, in the direct network around you and leveraging those people and then getting your stuff out there. If your friends really like your stuff, they will pump it. If they don't like your stuff, then maybe you don't have a product that has enough value for people. Maybe it's, it's never going to work, no matter how many eyeballs you get it in front of. So I think that um, aggregators are great. I don't think that they are a barrier to entry at all. And I think that if your content is good, good enough, then there are definitely ways that people will see it. I, that's a great a great comment, right, and I, I did want to go. Of the Actually, hold on, sorry, J sorry, James, go ahead. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Hangouts hangouts lag always happens. Um, My question had to do with. Uh... What, well, I guess I'll just go ahead. Um, we are all eager to ask you questions. This is kind. Of, this is stuff we talk about yeah, on a regular guys, take outside a, take of this. Yeah, we 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 were in the chat, but um, I, I think what I wanted to say is that my history is in is in music, right? That's where I worked at uh, ten years ago, and I saw it, and I saw I saw everything actually get much better for artists. Got much right. worse for labels, much worse for distribution methods, but it, it's way better now for artists, even with the Spotify model that gets all kinds of heat. 
Um, and, you know, over the weekend, uh, Eric and I actually had a chance to see Shooter Jennings here in Atlanta. He's, he's someone who's became a great friend of mine because of his interest in Bitcoin. Shooter is a huge, huge fan of Bitcoin. I, I, I don't think there's anyone in any kind of entertainment field that I've seen that's as interested as him, with the exception of maybe Ashton Kutcher. But what I will say is he's such a rare exception from someone who gets this and gets the need for artists to control their distribution methods. It, it makes you see how so few others understand this. And mm -hmm. they think Spotify is this big, bad beast, when in reality... It's a platform that they should embrace more and use to reach out to their fans. Yeah. It's, you know, it is paying them, and yeah, maybe it isn't as much as they want, but it's a better alternative than people downloading it for free. The service is nice, and it's improved. I've seen everything improve in 10 years, and it's really, yeah. you know, it's really great. Music, to me, was the first one. It moved fastest, besides, you know, print, text, and reading, and, you know, reading materials. But um, it really is something that just, you know... Uh, Artists don't seem to want to understand. And one of my other shocks when I worked at BitPay was um, the, the, just the overall vibe at Warner Brothers Records, who were very forward-thinking about this stuff, surprisingly so. Mm -hmm. And I worked at a label about 10 years ago with a really large artist, a really well-known one, and um, among others, and, and very not, like, just did not embrace anything close to the Internet at the time. And you see how they evolved. They're made, they made their money, and Warner's making their money. But how do we really communicate this to artists? And, you know, the user interface is key, but really the messaging is even more key. And there needs to be a, a retaliatory message from the RAA, MPAA folks that are so anti-decentralization uh, because, it, it, you know, it threatens their business models. And how, how do we go about that? How do we get this messaging out to artists, you know, whatever art they make? Right. Um, I, I think that... Music, I mean, it's fascinating to me, and I used to be a huge fan of Napster when it was around, and I would download so much music, and I remember when, you know, they, they were being shut down, and I, I was, like, writing letters. I was, you know, a teenager in Australia. I was, like, writing letters to these U.S. senators saying, don't touch Napster. Um, because it actually, I mean, it was an incredible resource for me. If I don't know a band, I'm not going to go and buy their album. Um, I am probably going to try and find some of their content for free and listen to it. If I like their stuff, I'm probably going to download an album, right? I have to like it enough, though. Now, I think what happens when you have any sort of um, pirating platform that really takes off, that's a sign that there's some sort of market inefficiency. You know, it's, it's not really working. Uh, consumers aren't getting what they want. And what you saw happen was iTunes popped up around that time. You know, suddenly you could buy a song, a single song, for 99 cents. And that was incredible because I'm, you know, I'm happy to buy a single song for 99 cents. It doesn't really seem that much. And if I like it, uh, I'll buy it, you know. I'm also happy to experiment with songs by buying something and see if I like it because I'm not investing in an entire album. So you really did see the market come in and pick up the slack there. Um, I'm still devastated Napster disappeared because, as you say, I mean, like when you have free music platforms, what I found with, with Napster is it actually incentivized people to uh, explore new types of music. You know, the, uh, uh, the emergence of the Napster stars, that was an incredible phenomenon. It was people who, you know, they hadn't um, uh, been on the radio ever, they hadn't, you know, been discovered in any other way, they didn't have a label, but they were being discovered and had a huge Napster following, you know, that, that was incredible. Bands, um, uh, there's a movie called Downloaded, I think it is, by uh, the guy who was in um, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, actually, it's, it's a good movie, um, and it talks, it interviews some of these Napster bands that emerged um, and they'd go to this city they'd never been to before and they'd, again, never been played on the radio. There's no reason why these people would know them. They'd go to a concert. They'd do it like a small gig. And, um, and suddenly there'd be like a crowd filled with people uh, who all knew the words to their songs. And they, it blew their minds. They were like, how do these people know the words to our songs? You know, there's been no outreach. How do we get out to them? And that's the decentralized method of peer-to-peer -peer sharing. You know, I learned some that someone on Napster, one of the users, has great music taste, so I start exploring the other things in their files. I start seeing what other music I might like, and I discover all this new music. And that incredible uh, decentralization and the network of music that formed from that you know, revolutionized music, and it changed forever after that. I think that we're going to see more and more of that in the film industry as well. 
um, you know, I think that the film industry is now like where music was 10 years ago. Uh, we're seeing more and more decentralization. We're seeing more and more like YouTube branding, you know. Uh, these days when you were talking before about how do you know, you know, how do you get your stuff out there if you're not on HBO or Netflix or one of these aggregators, you do it by creating a personal brand. And I think that I mean, traditionally, musicians didn't have to worry about marketing. They didn't have to worry about publicity. If you could get a record deal, they did that for you. And I think those, I mean, those were happy days, I guess, for people who didn't like the business side of things. But honestly, everything is a business. If you want your films to succeed, if you want your music to succeed, you have to build an incredible brand. And so much of this industry now is branding. And you see this with YouTube stars and their incredible branding. Now, you know, I can go to YouTube and uh, I don't have to sit through, sift through a trillion different videos. If I know that there is a specific YouTube channel that I like that regularly produces content, I'll probably just subscribe to them and they'll tell me whenever a new thing comes up. So um, I think decentralization is fantastic. Um, I think that you know more and more artists need to embrace it, but they also need to realize that they're a, it's an incredibly hard slog. They have to be business savvy. They have to put in so much more effort into the publicity and marketing and branding side of things, whereas before they might have wanted to just focus on their music. That's great, but you, you won't succeed in this world. You, know, you, you can't just rest on your laurels and, and play good music and think that that's enough anymore because it's just not. And I, you know, I have a degree in classical music, so I'm around musicians who are very focused and they just practice their instruments and that's fantastic. Incredible musicians, but honestly, they're not going to be the ones to succeed. They're not going to be the ones to uh, really get ahead unless they can actually communicate to others that they are the best in their field and they can't do that without incredible branding. Yeah, so you're really touching on something uh, about economics, really, and what I'd like to call applied economics. The, the whole concept of letting, like, having the market forces rush in uh, to fill a void, and that's why these piracy platforms exist. That's why the, they are so successful is because they, there is a huge gap between what the current market offers and what the, 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 the rest of the market desires, mm -hmm. right? Um, so talk to us a little bit about you know, how you got into the economics. You sort of describe yourself as an economics evangelist. <laughs> uh, and what does that mean and where would you get it from? What does that mean? It means that I am constantly butting heads with people who have these incredibly noble visions for policies they would like enacted in society. And Milton Friedman once said that you should never judge a policy by its intentions, judge it by its consequences. And I just kind of got... I mean, I got really frazzled with dealing with these people. And you know what? Their hearts are in the right place. And we all want to change the world. We all want to make it better. We want to make people um, uh, wealthier. We want to you know, make sure that it's everyone has an equal opportunity, all of those things. Um, but if you're enacting <laughs> policies that just have terrible economic outcomes and you know zilch about economics and you don't realize all of the unintended consequences that will come from a policy like that, you are just going to destroy society. And we have had so many bad policies enacted and all of these unintended consequences have flourished and people's lives have been destroyed. Um, you know, you try to help someone, you end up just enacting a, a policy that helps special interest groups. All of this stuff, I mean, it's, it's really important that more people understand economics. I'm involved with a number of institutions that try to educate people about economics. I, I, I really can't stress <laughs> enough how important it is. You know, I work with MANCAL. I'm on their advisory council. Um, so their Economic Education Foundation. I'm an alumni speaker for FEE, Foundation for Economic Education. I'm an alumni speaker for Atlas Network, which does a lot with economics. I host the Learn Liberty Academy. And um, you know, I work with the Moving Picture Institute, and we're all about freedom. So um, we we do deal with economics, but really we, we deal with individual freedom, and that comes into play a lot with Austrian economics. Um, so I, I fell madly in love with economics the more I learned about it. I, I studied economics at college and hated it, thought it was incredibly dry, wondered why I was doing this to myself. I must have been a masochist. Um, and then I, you know, I took a lot of time off from it. And then I, I sort of met my mentor, who's the economics editor at uh, Barrett's, Gene Epstein. And he basically gave me a reading list a mile long. You know, I, I saw him speak at a conference. 
and I, my mind was blown. All of the facts that he came up with in this conference, I'd never been exposed to anything like that. And he was saying things and I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't even know that organization existed. I want to learn more about this. And so I, yeah, I met with him. He gave me a reading list a mile long and I just read economic book after economics book after economics book. And, um, and from there, you know, I was, I was caught. <laughs> there was no getting out of it now. So um, I, it's something that very much works its way into all of the things that I, I do with my life. And I, it's very important to me, like, through, I, I find Bitcoin to be a great tool for educating people about monetary policy. Um, I, I find a lot of these great decentralized technologies we have these days to be a great tool uh, to teach people about the economic structure that underpins it. Um, so, I mean, understanding economics is all around us. It helps us make good decisions in our everyday life. And it also helps us to fight uh, for the right battles, you know, make sure that we're we're not just blindly, you know, smashing things and hoping we can make a difference. Let's actually get educated and let's get focused and understand how to make a difference. I love what you just said, and I actually have two things to to reply to that about uh, that really are fascinating because there one of them is directly involved with a project that I'm now working on um, that uh, I accepted recently. But the first part is an article I read in New York Times yesterday or day before yesterday. Uh, basically questioning if economics is a pseudoscience. I love the article for one reason and one reason only because it just it, it actually get provided the point that why can't we admit we don't know things? Like that is like the number one way to learn things is admitting you don't know and no one likes to do that but in reality those who do that usually end up ahead that's just more of a human nature thing, but that's also going to segue into Bitcoin did get me more into, into economics. Absolutely. It got me into Hayek. It made, a lot of his things made sense to me. You know, it, and, and the other step that happened when I joined this project, which is I got to meet someone named Robin Hansen. Uh, I already had a, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but I had a, uh, a background, uh, an interest in Bayesian statistics, and his was more on this prediction market model of, of economics, a model I, I, I actually did not know much about. The more I studied it, the more I go, this makes a lot of sense. How come I'm not hearing about this until now? How come this is cast off to this weird little corner of the internet? Um, and what, what, what are people doing to develop this? Because we have a, a model that has actually been somewhat proven, I don't want to say proven on a grand scale, but proven to be successful in a lot of different ways to incentive, to make, you know, making better decisions incentivized. And it, it's just something different and new just like Bitcoin, different and new, challenging norms. Does that vary, doesn't that bother you though about economics and economic education is that they, you can get so many different reading materials and in the end you really don't know what you read and all you know is that some things made sense, some didn't, you research them more and then maybe you can process that but not, they're not really written for the average person they're, they're written for someone that is, you know, in academia, and quite often a blog could do a better job, which is why I think your job is so valuable. Is that, is that a problem you see? And, you know, what are some other solutions that we can look at to make people more interested in economics? Right. Um, I'll start with the last question. So trying to make people more interested in economics is a difficult task. <laughs> it's a very difficult task. Um, you know, I, I have two performance degrees, so it is probably a miracle that I ended up being so passionate about economics. It is not the uh, expected career path uh, for someone who's interested in the arts. Um, that being said, people are interested in learning, and we shouldn't underestimate their ability to understand papers that are well written. I find that a lot of economics, uh, it is just a bunch of... Um, uh, sorry, I just got like a random message pop up on my, my screen. Um, crazy Mac where they you know link everything together. Centralized, not decentralized. Um, uh, so I think that there are ways that you can make economics fun. You know, that you know, I, I know that you wanted to talk about the Bitcoin Girl music video. Uh, that for me sort of touched on some principles uh, like a finite supply of currency versus versus an uh, inflationary currency. I think that if you can make fun ways to introduce people to ideas, make it digestible, then that will, help, will be how you get people interested in it. And people do want to know about this stuff, but they need to know why they want to know about it. So the key is to letting people know why it's important and why it matters and um, why, how there are some tremendously bad policy decisions being made based on a flawed understanding of economics. So get people interested in, in that side of things. Um, 
I think that the first part you said uh, when you're talking about it being a pseudoscience, I mean, economics is exactly what you said. You have a lot of central figures um, who are dealing with so many, like, so many variables. It's incomprehensible how many different variables there are, and they think that they can centrally plan decision making. You know, when I choose whether or not I'm going to buy that juice. You know, there are so many things at play that determine this decision. You know, what's in the juice, how much it is, the um, distance to my from my apartment to the juice, like all of these different things. So, what makes a single person in the government think that they have enough knowledge to plan everyone's decision making process in the economy? Why are they creating policies to to price fix or determine these sorts of things? Um, it blows my mind, and it always backfires, and it just does lead to so many unintended consequences. We definitely should not be viewing economics as uh, this thing that we can predict. We should be allowing individuals to make their own economic decisions. Uh, put as much power as we can into the individual's hands and take it away from central authorities because, you know, there's always the risk that they will uh, pander to special interest groups. There's always the risk of corruptibility. There's always the risk of, you know, just human mistakes. So why do we want to centralise all of that when we can disperse that, disperse the consequences of that, um, put it back to like an individual responsibility basis rather than allowing a single person to say, oops, that was a mistake, but it's decimated the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just really bad decision making in, in my point of view. Yeah, Naomi, I, I totally agree. I think sort of refocusing things on individual liberties and rights and freedoms is, is the only appropriate economic policy. And uh, I think a lot of our guys believe the same thing. Um, but I want to move on a little bit from, from economics and, and decentralization and talk to us a little bit about some of the other projects you're working on. Tell us about Subconscious. Uh, what's it about? When's it coming? Tell us where to find about it. Right. Well, I mean, this is a great uh, example of a decentralized sort of filmmaking process. Uh, we were a very low budget film, and we ended up doing very well. And that's, you know, the, the director of this film, Georgia Hilton, is incredible. You know, she. Um, she has really taken advantage of all of the incredible uh, consequences of of um, the dispersion of technology, the democratization of technology. So our camera equipment was affordable now because you can buy incredible camera equipment these days for a very low price. Um, the visual effects uh, software is incredible. So you just have to have the discipline to learn how to use it and you can save a whole lot of money. So you no longer need to be a giant studio to make a, a fantastic film. And Georgia is probably the most disciplined and incredibly talented director I've, I've ever worked with and she just forged right through and taught herself everything there was to know about visual effects and came we came away with the film um, where we made you know three times our money and we're a Lionsgate uh, distributed film in in uh, North America so I yeah that experience was just positive from from start to finish I'm working on a new film with her at the moment um, which is, is really exciting and that's also through the Moving Picture Institute um, so that film, I mean, it's, it's, as I said, incredibly low budget. When you talk about the budget of films in Hollywood, again, Hollywood still has this mindset of what's a big budget, what's a low budget. So they'll refer to a micro budget film as four to five million. Um, we've made our film for, for a lot less <laughs> than that, you know. Um, I, I'm not sure whether I'm meant to give out numbers on the internet, so I won't. But it was a lot less than that, and we're distributed by Lionsgate and the film looks fantastic as I said just because of the the talent of the people involved so yeah that that project was fantastic um, uh, through the Moving Picture Institute I have a, a ton of projects that I'm working on at the moment well falling over um, uh, so that's exciting, you know, I'm working with Liberty.me, they're a fantastic platform, sort of like the, the Facebook of uh, freedom-oriented people, people who believe in individual rights. Uh, go to Liberty.me, it's a, it's a great place to learn things. When we talk about the democratization of knowledge, you know, you don't need to get a university degree uh, anymore if, if you want to actually learn things. Uh, go to a site like liberty.me and you have so much free content there, so many free books, free podcasts, interviews with professors. It's just a great platform for learning if you're an autodidact type of person. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 there's so many projects, I can't, I can't even uh, keep track of them, but they're, they're some of the, the big ones. 
Okay, excellent. So we're going to wrap it up. Um, tell us where our viewers can find you. Uh, what should they look at? Web addresses, social media. Give us your plug. Right, my plug. Well, my Twitter handler is at Sky Corridors. Um, I'm going to tell you where that came from. So, I mean, it's a bit random. It's not like at Naomi Brockwell or anything. That would be far too apt. Uh, but Sky Corridors, I just love, um, this is going to sound so ridiculous. You know when the clouds are in the sky, when like the, the sun breaks through them and it has these shafts of light coming down? It looks like there are you know, corridors in the sky, and I just love that image. So that's where you can find me, at Sky Corridors. Um, on Instagram, I'm the same name, at Sky Corridors. Uh, on Facebook, Naomi Brockwell. I think I'm the only Naomi Brockwell on the internet, which is kind of cool. Um, on my, you know, I have several pages. I have RainsworthProductions.com. That's my production company. Um, NaomiBrockwell.com. That's my page. I have my Liberty.me page, NaomiBrockwell.Liberty.me. That's probably where my content gets updated the most. So I have all of the clips from you know Stossel appearances, um, uh, Independence appearances. I've been in the Wall Street Journal a few times, so you can find all of that stuff aggregated there. Um, and yeah, Bitcoin Girl. Uh, dot com is a, is another thing. So um, bit dot org. I mean, uh, yeah, lo lots of different places. Uh, I should be all over the internet, so you should be able to find me pretty easily. Excellent. So trivia: uh, those rays that you're describing, those sky corridors, they're known as crepuscular rays. Ooh. And uh, I have to admire you because I think your your name is a little more poetic than the word crepuscular. So. <laughs> Crepuscular. I'm going to start you doing that. My new Twitter handler, everyone, is at Crepuscular. Um, it's going to be. It's going to catch on. It just rolls off the tongue. Crepuscular. It's going to be great. <laughs> well, Naomi, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been a fantastic interview, and we hope to have you on again soon. Super. Thank you so much, guys. Lovely chatting with you. Español, English, Deutsch. Normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos in English and Spanish. Normalerweise produciere ich nur videos en English and Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ja, algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now, already some weeks ago, I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I'm sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten uh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin and give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und Motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. 
Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgendem. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, minimum 10 or besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero, and the next time uh, you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante. O maybe a tip in a restaurant. Una trinkelt en un restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin. De direcciones de Bitcoin. Or when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin Adressen druckt, auch die, uh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Address Schlüsseln, um, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015, 
escribir la fecha más plus cuatro años eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin eh, en estos cuatro años, yo lo vuelvo a tener. Tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in this um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, ciao, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. En mi video antiguo he explicado eh, cómo he tomado la decisión de los cuatro años. In my old video I explained how I made the decision for the four years. In meinem Originalvideo habe ich erklärt, wie ich zu die Entscheidung getroffen habe äh, mit den vier Jahren. A continuación voy a pegar este Video. Now later I will paste this video. Im Anschluss werde ich diesen Video ankleben. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy económico. Uh, at the moment the price of Bitcoin is very cheap. Pero casi todo el mundo tiene muy poco dinero para invertir. But almost everybody has a very little money to invest. Debería decir que esta idea me vino hoy especialmente cuando vi otra vez una chica ahí pidiendo dinero por la calle. Actually, I must say first this idea today I got especially when I saw again um, one girl begging for money in the street. Me gustaría ayudar, pero yo tampoco me sobra mucho el dinero. I would really like to help everybody, but I, I don't have either. 
too much money. And así que me vino la siguiente idea. So I got the following idea. It's, uh, it's más bien un juego. Uh, it's a, rather a game. Um, lo que es muy importante elegir un monedero de Bitcoin que solo tú mismo, mismo tienes la llave privada. What is very important to choose um, Bitcoin wallet a company which you only possess the private key. For example, uh, blockchain.info. Por ejemplo, la empresa blockchain.info. Luego, imprimir en papel um, la llave privada y también guardarlo tú mismo. Then to print in paper the private key and uh, of course save for, for yourself that private key. Bueno, ya estamos imprimiendo, imprime por lo menos 10. So now we are already printing, so at least print 10 directions, 10 direcciones. Luego pones algo de Bitcoin, una cantidad, lo que, lo que te da la gana en esta dirección. Then you put some Bitcoin, uh, the amount, whatever you want, in, that, in these directions. Y la próxima vez que sales de casa ya tienes algo que dar a los que están ahí pidiendo por la calle. And the next time you go out of the house, you have already something to give for these people who are begging on the streets. Y por ejemplo, y claro, para tus amigos, amigas, and for your friends, of course. Eso da motivación a la gente para aprender Bitcoin y And this gives motivation for the people to learn about Bitcoin. Y la parte del juego consiste en lo siguiente. And the game part uh, consists in the following. Explicas a la gente, mira, esta es la cl clave privada, que es la clave secreta. You explain to the people, look, this is the private key, which must be secret. And uh, you have it and uh, me. And uh, explicas, esa persona y yo mismo la tiene. Y antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambia un poco de idea de hasta cuatro años. First, I thought of five years, but then I changed uh, my opinion to four years. Later, explain. Después, lo expli explico por qué. Les dices, mira, tienes cuatro años para poner esta cantidad de Bitcoin a otra dirección. Si no lo, lo has quitado después de cuatro años, yo lo quito. So you explain them, you have four years to take this Bitcoin out of this direction, of this secret uh, key direction. If uh, you don't do it, uh, I do it after these four years. So you lose this. That's the, this part of the game. It's uh, la parte del juego. He creado este hashtag uh, BTC4 para hacerlo un poco popular. I created this hashtag BTC4 to make it a little popular. 
antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié a cuatro porque te has dado cuenta que en los Simpsons eh, la gente tiene cuatro dedos y solo do, Dios tiene cinco dedos. Um, first, I thought of five years, but then I changed my mind to four years. Um, did you notice that in The Simpsons, people have four fingers and only God has five fingers? Uh, I'll show some pictures. Voy a enseñar algunas imágenes de Los Simpsons. De los manos y dedos de Simpsons. Some pictures of the hands and fingers of Simpsons. Uh, pero antes quiero recordar que um, es muy probable que en también cuatro o cinco en los próximos años el valor de Bitcoin puede subir mucho. Just want to remember before that uh, the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin can rise very much in these next years. Así que si solo pones una cantidad pequeña más tarde, puede ser de gran ayuda. Even if you just put a little small amount later, it can be big help. Uh, no solo para, bueno, es un juego. <laughs> si la persona lo quita antes de cuatro años, para, es para esta persona. Si no, es para ti. Si te recuerdas y guardas bien la llave privada. So uh, it's... This is the game part. If uh, the, the person takes the money out, it's for that person. But if they forget it after these four years, you can take it out. And it can be really... <laughs> bueno, imprimir también la llave pública y la llave privada. Y si, por ejemplo... Okay, first translate. Print and not just the private key, but on also the public key. Así que si, por ejemplo, explicas a la gente. Mira, si alguna persona quiere enviarte Bitcoin, pero tú no tienes ninguna dirección, así que puedes dar este, esta llave pública a la persona. Mira, muy bien, la llave pública, no la llave secreta das a esa persona o cualquier persona y te pueden enviar Bitcoin a esa dirección. So, remember, uh, the public key you can give to anybody and if somebody wants to send you some Bitcoin and, you, and this person doesn't have any, so you have already this public address where they can send you Bitcoin. ¿Qué es Bitcoin? Bitcoin es la primera moneda digital descentralizada. Los bitcoins son monedas digitales que puedes enviar a través de Internet. Comparado con otras alternativas, Bitcoin tiene numerosas ventajas. Los bitcoins son transferidos directamente de persona a persona a través de la red sin pasar por un banco u otro intermediario. Esto significa que las comisiones son mucho menores, puedes usarlo en cualquier país, tu cuenta no puede ser congelada y no hay prerequisitos o límites arbitrarios. Miremos cómo funciona. Los bitcoins son generados en todo internet por cualquiera con un programa gratuito llamado Minero de Bitcoin. Crear bitcoins requiere una cierta cantidad de trabajo para cada bloque de monedas. Esta cantidad se ajusta automáticamente por la red, para que los bitcoins siempre sean creados a un ratio predecible y limitado. Tus bitcoins se guardan en tu billetera digital, que te resultará familiar si usas banca digital. Cuando transfieres bitcoins, una firma electrónica es añadida. Pasados unos minutos, la transacción es verificada por el minero y es almacenada permanente y anónimamente por la red. El software de Bitcoin es completamente abierto y cualquiera puede revisar el código. Bitcoin está cambiando las finanzas de la misma manera que la web ha cambiado el periodismo. Cuando cualquiera tiene acceso al mercado global, florecen grandes ideas. 
Miremos algunos ejemplos de cómo los bitcoins están usándose hoy en día. Puedes comprar videojuegos, regalos, libros, servidores y calcetines de alpaca. Existen varias casas de cambio donde puedes intercambiar tus bitcoins por dólares, euros y más. Los bitcoins son una gran forma para que pequeños negocios y autónomos reciban publicidad. No cuesta nada empezar a aceptarlos, no hay cargos o comisiones y recibirás negocio adicional de la economía Bitcoin. Para tus primeros Bitcoins y más información visita weusecoins.com Bueno, ahora voy a enseñar algunas imágenes de los dedos de Simpsons. Now I'll show you some pictures of the fingers of Simpsons. The four fingers. Los cuatro dedos y cinco dedos de Dios. Uh, four fingers and five fingers of God of Simpsons. Right now, there are more people on the internet than there were on the planet in 1960. We're raising money. And it's easier to be discovered than ever before. It takes a full team to make each one of our videos. But the internet needs better software to help us reward one another for our work. Advertisers value you differently. They say that 1,000 of you is only worth $6. Any help is very much appreciated. Please fund this project. We need your help. Currently and historically, a 
exposed to secret society, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment, of pertinent facts, far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Face the facts, join our hands, make a stand. Uh -huh. It's time to gather plans, get the shot, take the chance. Till there is no one left, stay correct to the death. They can't ever break a freedom, we will never let them. The corrupt politics is killing the system. Cynicism is it, and it's everything that you witness. They tell you what to think, make you believe that they're the realness. They feed us full of lies, and yet we always forgive them. Huh? It's all conspiracy, and if you feed an inner witch, you're the puppet. The government's pulling strings from above you. It's time for the introduction to truth. Let's start a movement. We've all been brainwashed. They believe that we all are stupid. We believe in what we see and whatever our ears are hearing. But if you look close, listen, gather your own opinion. You'll understand all the lies, lines, and what's between them. This world is not your oyster. This world is a fucking prison. Come on. happening in our nation. We won't stand up for the fear of assassination. So they strip us of everything. We stand there and just take it. We're scared to make a stand a false flag operation. Research Illuminati. Find out by 9-11. You see they line their pockets. Don't believe the lies they tell us. Find us seek the truth. Realize we need to do whatever it is we can to protect our lives. It's time for us to do when the conspiracy or not. They owe some explanations to the questions that we got. What are the skull and bones? What is lying beneath? All these secretive meats got you lying between your teeth. What's with the Bilderberg? I'm burning your effigies. I'm praying a Lucifer. How sickness can you be? While all of the time praying you believing in the peace. Just to keep up appearances within Christianity. Come on. Why we gotta stand for the new 